Tonight, queer organizations in the GTA clap back at the leader of the federal conservatives. The conservative party has a lot to lose by weighing in on this issue. Pierre Polyev endorses parts of Alberta's proposed changes restricting gender-affirming health care. We'll show you what Ontario's conservative premier has to say about it. We believe he's in Somalia. Plus, challenging chase for a murder suspect, the now international manhunt in the case of the shooting death of an innocent mother last summer in Leslieville. This is a crime of opportunity, and it needs to be stopped. And done with brazen break-ins, what a group of small business owners was asking for at City Hall today. Good evening, I'm Chris Glover. Beginning tonight with comments the federal conservative leader made in Ottawa today that are making waves in our region tonight. Two LGBTQ plus groups in the GTA are concerned with Pierre Polyev's stance on gender affirming health care. Polyev says he supports Alberta Premier Danielle Smith's position on minimum age requirements for things like puberty blockers. Dale Minuktuk starts us off tonight with that local reaction. So you think only adults? Right. Yeah. Only Facing adults. questions from reporters, conservative leader Pierre Polyev put on record his position on gender-affirming care. I think we should protect children, let them make adult decisions when they become adults. Polyev also confirmed he's against puberty blockers for people under the age of 18, the positions and the language catching 2S LGBTQ plus groups off guard. I would think that the uh, leader of the opposition and the Conservative Party has a lot to lose by weighing in on this issue, knowing that the policies that have been brought forth in Saskatchewan, New Brunswick and now Alberta uh, really have no basis in science or fact. Polyev's comments came a week after Alberta's Premier Danielle Smith released this video. It is my view that list of adult choices includes deciding whether or not to alter one's biological sex. Smith laid out a number of policy changes she intends to table in the fall, including schools requiring parents to get a heads up when there's a pronoun or name change of a student, and age restrictions on gender affirming care. There's no medical evidence to make any kind of restrictions. We have very good guidelines to help us manage trans youth, whether that be the use of puberty blockers, whether that be hormonal therapies. While similar legislation rolls out in other provinces, it won't be happening in Ontario, according to a spokesperson for the Ministry of Health. A statement to CBC Toronto says, as the Premier and Minister Jones have made clear, we will not be replicating the changes the Alberta government unveiled last week. Strong statements like that bring comfort to local advocacy groups, but if things were to change, they'd be ready to fight for their rights. In healthcare, we fought, you know, for homosexuality to be delisted as a mental illness. Illness. We fought for years and years during the AIDS crisis to get the healthcare we need, and we'll continue to fight for things like trans-affirming care as well. P Flag York Region is calling on residents in the GTA to contact their local MPs and ensure they're educated on the science of gender-affirming care. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. We're learning tonight that an Ontario Hockey League player is under police investigation and has been suspended indefinitely by the league. 21-year-old Connor Lockhart, who currently plays for the Oshawa Generals, is being investigated by Durham Police. A spokesperson for the service says it has not released any information about the investigation, saying it could jeopardize the process. The news of a police investigation comes as London Police Service investigates five former Canadian junior hockey players involved in an alleged sexual assault more than six years ago. The OHL says it was made aware of the investigation into Lockhart on Tuesday. Auto industry groups and politicians will descend on Ottawa tomorrow as a national summit gets underway to tackle auto theft. Federal government figures show the crime has jumped by 300 percent since 2015. Patrick Brown, the mayor of Brampton, will be presenting at the summit together with Peel Police. He's calling for tougher penalties for stealing cars. If you commit a drug offense or a gun offense, you're spending serious time in custody. That's not the case with auto thefts, and that's why you're seeing organized crime really double down and focus on auto thefts because it's such a low-risk, high-revenue opportunity for organized crime. Now, I would love to see real teeth for the criminal code for auto theft offenses. The Ford government is also looking for changes to the criminal code with mandatory minimum sentences for violent car thefts. Tomorrow's summit comes as the federal government announced today a $28 million investment to bolster the Border Service's ability to sh search shipping containers with stolen vehicles.
Violent extortion attempts are also an escalating problem in Peel region. Today, investigators made a number of arrests involving incidents against South Asian-owned businesses. But with similar crimes happening across the country, some feel a more coordinated response is needed. Patrick Swadden has that story. Peel police say the 29 extortion threats since November are targeting South Asian Canadian owned businesses, jewelry stores, trucking companies, restaurants and car dealerships to name a few. But today, some welcome news. There were four individuals that have been arrested and charged. Two 23 year old men and two women, 25 and 21 years old, charged for two separate extortion incidents. The work of Peel Police's 23 member task force convened in December to tackle the threat. A fifth suspect arrested also for extortion. The five suspects collectively face 24 charges, including arson and weapons offenses. Anyone targeting this community will not be tolerated at all. Chief Nishan Duryapa says suspects use social media messaging to demand money from businesses through threats of violence. Nine of the incidents police are investigating involve shootings. No injuries have been reported. This lawyer represents 10 of the targeted businesses, none of whom would speak publicly. These folks stop picking up the phone calls, you know, and that's also harming their business. The kids are afraid to go to school. So the whole, you know, life's been been, been turned in, uh, in upside and down. You just uh, they're living in a fear. Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown saying similar incidents involving extortion shootings and arson have been reported in B.C. and Alberta, raising the concern that organized crime is behind the violent shakedowns. The desire for there to be coordination is happening. We are liaising with uh, municipal uh, provincial and federal police agencies, um, you know, nationally, internationally, so that we can put a lens on this. This expert saying incidents are likely underreported based on a culture of fear. If the victims don't uh, don't bother or are too afraid to report it to police, um, then it just feeds into that that fear loop. A pattern Peel police are hoping to break, but Gordon says international gang members are likely behind the violence and that'll require a more robust response. It's really an initiative that the RCMP uh, need to seize hold of um, because it is clearly not only national in scope. Something he says will require cooperation not just from Ottawa, but from the victims themselves. People are hesitant to come forward. Um, you know, what I can say is that we are moving forward, we are making arrests, we are charging people, um, and so I am, you know, urging people to come forward. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Mississauga. Back in Toronto, police have now identified a third suspect in connection with a shooting in Leslieville from last summer. A 44-year-old mother of two died after she was hit by a stray bullet while walking along Queen Street East last July. While the hunt for the latest suspect now reaches the media, investigators think he's already left the country. Greg Ross has the latest from police. Good morning and thank you for coming. Police believe they have identified the third and final suspect involved in a brazen daylight shooting last summer. And we're requesting the public's assistance in locating Ahmed Ali, 19 of Toronto, who's wanted on a Canada-wide warrant for manslaughter and robbery with a firearm. Police say Ali was involved in a gunfight during the noon hour on July 7th of last year. A stray bullet from that altercation struck and killed 44-year-old Caroline Hubner Makarat, who was running some errands along Queen Street East at the time. Police believe Ali may have fled the country shortly after the murder. We believe he's in Somalia. I don't believe we have an extradition uh, treaty with Somalia. So uh, I'm hoping that either he, uh, he sees this and uh, makes arrangements to surrender or his family talk him into surrendering. Two other men have already been arrested and remain in police custody. 32-year-old Damien Hudson is charged with second-degree murder. 20-year-old Ahmed Mustafa Ibrahim is charged with manslaughter, robbery, and failed to comply with probation. These three people, we believe, were involved in the drug trade and had an altercation as a result of that. Police believe Ali and Ibrahim attacked Hudson with the intent to rob him. Hudson and Ali exchanged gunfire. Hubner Makarat was an innocent bystander who police believe was hit by a bullet from Hudson's gun. 
Police have also arrested a fourth suspect in connection with this shooting, Khalila Zara Muhammad, who worked at a safe injection site inside the South Riverdale Community Health Center, which is just steps from where the shooting happened. She is charged with accessory after the fact and obstruction of justice. There is a definitive connection between there being a supervised injection site here and the fact that drug dealers congregated around this site for a very long time. Derek Finkel is an investigative journalist who lives just steps from the community center. He's also involved with multiple community organizations that are trying to have the safe injection site there removed. Leslieville's become a, 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 a bursting at the seams with children and schools and daycares. There's, like I said, there's six daycares within a stone's throw of this supervised injection site, and does that make sense? Hubner Makarot was a wife and mother of two young daughters. The Ontario Health Minister launched a critical incident review of 17 consumption and treatment services sites following this shooting. A supervisor was also appointed at the Leslieville site to make improvements. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. An update tonight on Toronto's latest homicide. Police have now identified the victim. 18-year-old Isaiah Junger was killed in a shooting yesterday morning. It happened at around 1.30 a.m. near Bloor and Lansdowne. He was rushed to hospital where he later died. Anyone with information or camera footage is asked to contact police. All right, looking live at the city tonight, clear skies and one degree right now with even more uh, of a warm up coming over the next couple of days. And Victor Paolo is here now with the first check on the forecast. Victor, I know you are anticipating some wet weather, but not for a little bit yet. Well, Chris, you do see the rain behind me, and that is because we are expecting it to come down, but not until 24 hours. But before that rainfall comes, we will see increased cloudiness here in the GTA, and we'll also see some increase in the temperatures. We are going to be experiencing some warmer days the closer we get to the weekend. Now, when it comes to precipitation, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Minus 2 is your average high for this time of year, and minus 10.5 is your average low. And that precipitation, which we will talk about right about now, well, we're only expecting about a millimeter to fall. Should be all said and done by your commute home by the time we reach Friday. Now, taking a closer look at that rain when it does pass through, well, it's going to be coming overnight around 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And as mentioned, should be all said and done around supper time on your commute home on Friday. Now, tomorrow morning when my little ones and your little ones are getting ready for school, well, it's going to be 1 degree, feeling like minus 1 with a mix of sun and cloud. And a quick peek at our three-day forecast, well, look at that increase of temperatures. Make sure to stay tuned to Chris and I for the rest of your three- and seven-day forecast. All right, Victor, thank you. To City Hall now, where council is backpedaling on a short-lived tobogganing ban. Councillors voting late this afternoon to lift a ban on tobogganing at 45 city parks that were previously deemed unsafe. Councillor Brad Bradford brought forward the motion at City Hall after claiming Toronto was turning into a, quote, no-fun city. He argued residents would continue tobogganing despite the restriction. Bradford's motion was eventually seconded by the mayor and supported by 20 other councillors. City staff will now install new signs warning about the potential risks of tobogganing and bring back hay bales at the bottom of hills. Also garnering attention at City Hall today, small business break and enters. One of Toronto's deputy mayors is calling for a summit on the crime problem with the city, police and big banks. City Hall reporter Sean Jeffords is tracking that story tonight. But thank you for coming. A group of small business owners made their way to City Hall today to ask for help. My place uh, robbed 10 times. They've been the victims of brazen smash and grab thefts, some as many as 10 times. This is a crime of opportunity and it needs to be stopped. It frays the fabric that binds our community together. Glass was smashed. And David Fisher of Grief's Bakery says his business was hit by the thieves. They went right to our tills, ripped out the tills made a big mess in the store and uh, and then you know we weren't you know the police are so busy they're not even able to respond uh, until you know late, early a few hours later. Nathan. Thank you Mike. The owner of United the Bakers United Dairy United says the business was also robbed the by the brazen thieves but he says the crimes are targeting something new point of sale credit card terminals. We were hit we were robbed. Our glass was smashed with the exact same MO as David Fisher from Greif's mentioned. Within two minutes, they were in and out. They were knew what they were exactly what they were doing. They went right for the visa terminals. The thieves take the machines and then use them to steal thousands of dollars. They hack the terminals at another location and issue refunds onto prepaid credit cards. 
There is a 54 percent increase. Deputy Mayor Mike Cole says these stories are becoming a regular occurrence across the city. The veteran councillor says these are just a few from his ward of Eglinton Lawrence. In all my years, I have never had as many reports about break-ins that I have had in the last two or three months. That's why he wants governments, police and financial institutions to find a solution. Without it, he fears small businesses will continue to be victimized. I'm calling for a, uh, a summit meeting of shopkeepers, small business people, the uh, police, the financial service providers, experts in technology to come together and give us an assessment of what we can do to stop this uh, crime wave that's uh, destroying small business. In the meantime, Cole is urging shopkeepers to protect themselves. A lot of them still have their point of sale terminals on their front desk and you can see them from the window and I've told everybody please lock up your point of sale terminals, hide them, get them out of view because that's what they're going for. City councillors backed his call for a summit on the crimes. But it's not immediately clear who will join Cole and the business owners at the table. Sean Jeffords, CBC News. Returning now to take you to Georgetown and the scene of a fatal house fire. Officers were called to a home on Victoria Street at 520 this morning. When they arrived, the house was engulfed in flames and the fire had already spread next door. As a result of the blaze, nearby homes had to be evacuated. Police say a woman died in the fire, and investigators say she was living in the house and no one else was injured. The investigation into what caused the fire is still under investigation. East now to Whitby, where the mayor is calling on the province to uphold its part of a deal to build a new hospital in Durham region. A site for the hospital was first identified more than two years ago, but the mayor has been saying that there has been no progress since then. Tyler Cheese has the details. Durham residents say they need a new hospital, something they were promised over two years ago. 100% we should have it. And I'm getting older, so we need it more. And there's a lot of people my age in the area. Yeah. We do need it. You end up having to take a day off work to, to really go in and find the health care that you need because there just isn't anything local that really supplies our needs. Lake Ridge Health chose this plot of land near highways 407 and 412 as the preferred site for a new hospital back in January 2022. But Whitby's mayor says nothing's been done since then to make that happen. Two years is too long, especially when it takes 10 years to build a new hospital. She says the region's current hospitals aren't able to keep up with demand. We have seen overcrowded emergencies. We have excessively long wait times, patients in unfunded beds, and patients waiting up to three days to be admitted to a hospital. That's unacceptable. Members of the town of Whitby's hospital task force are also concerned. We are one of the fastest growing regions in all of Canada. Uh, our current hospitals are at and over capacity and we have significant growth coming. It is extremely important for the quality of life for our residents to address the current need and the growing demand. She says they're waiting on two pieces from the government that will allow them to get started. One is the land is currently owned by the Ministry of Transportation. So we are looking for the land acquisition from the Ministry of Transportation. The second piece that's needed from the government is a planning grant, a capital planning grant for Lake Ridge Health to be able to move forward with the design of the hospital and the next steps. But she's hopeful the province will respond to their call for immediate action. In a statement provided to CBC, a spokesperson for the Ministry of Health says it will continue to work closely with Lake Ridge Health and other partners on the next round of planning grants for this project to deliver more connected, convenient care in Durham Region. On its website, Lake Ridge Health confirms it takes about a decade to build a hospital and says it needs to move forward now. Tyler Cheese, CBC News, Whippy. Okay, once again tonight, not too chilly out there, and the warm-up over the next couple of days could see our temperatures flirting with double digits. Let's turn to Vic DiPaolo now with the long-range forecast.
We're going to look at the map of North America here. Well, we can note that Arctic air mass is working its way slowly down towards the southeast Ontario where we're located. Now, taking a look at our long range forecast and see exactly what that means. Well, as that Arctic air mass slowly works its way in, you can tell by the time we reach closer to Wednesday, that's when it's going to be almost all the way down in the southeast of Ontario. Now, what does that mean for us temperature wise? Well, we're expecting temperatures to drop down to where it feels closer to minus five. But before we get there, let's talk about tonight where it's going to be minus one, feeling like minus four. And if you do see behind me, there is a bit of cloud cover, but not too much. Maybe you'll be able to see some stars if you do look up at the skies. Now, when it comes to rainfall and how much we're going to be expecting between now and let's say Friday 2 p.m., well, the majority of it's going to be coming overnight Friday morning and towards your Friday afternoon. And by their commute home, it should be all said and done. And we're only expecting about a millimeter to fall, not that much rainfall. And here's what it looks like from a bird's eye view. It's going to be a bit of cloud cover coming in more than we've been experiencing earlier in this week. And also by the time we get towards your overnight, that's when that rain will come. Something we have not seen much of this week either. My big change compared to the weeks prior. But when that rain does fall through, mainly a lot of it will be coming during the overnight when a lot of us are sleeping. And by the time we start our day, it's going to be a mix of sun and cloud with some more scattered showers on the way. But looking at our three and seven day forecast, well, we do know that we are expecting to see those temperatures increase a bit of rain on Friday and we're expecting to also see those temperatures drop on your Sunday Monday Tuesday and Wednesday as we said see that Arctic air mass slowly working its way down to where we're located that's why you're gonna see the temperatures slowly but surely get colder but not too cold not as much as it was a couple of weeks ago in the middle of January hope you all have yourselves a lovely rest of your night and over to you Chris yeah not too bad for this time of year at all thank you Victa and we will be right back Welcome back. Ending the show tonight in Milton, where a sports festival is underway for kids with special needs. It really gives the students an atmosphere to be able to play sports that they may never have been able to play. Pick up a basketball for the first time, maybe kick a soccer ball for the first time, and really interact with their peers that maybe they normally don't play sports with. A great three-day festival underway. It's part of a partnership where elementary students with special needs come together to try different Special Olympics events. Nearly 400 students are registered for the fun, and organizers actually had to add an extra day this year because demand was so high. They say sports festivals such as today's are the first step for some of Ontario's 26,000 special needs athletes who eventually compete at the high school, community, or even national level. And that's it for our show tonight. I'll be back with you tomorrow night at 11, and we'll see you then.